Hello, everybody. It's nice to see all the screens and names suddenly just bursting into the room. Welcome to what apparently is the 85th Brooklyn Rail Wednesday poetry reading. I disavow the word radical, so I just, I can't use it, I'm sorry. This is the 85th, uh, 85th reading, and um, we're really uh, thrilled to have had this reading put together by uh, Hale Liza Gafori, and she's invited Ariana Raines, Fanny Howe, and Kaith Heller, and Timothy Liu um, to read. We're experiencing uh, mer mer mercury in retrograde, technical issues, which is why we were late today. But I'm actually really happy we were late because it makes it feel more like a poetry reading that takes place live, I mean, in person, because those things are supposed to start late. Um, sorry, I've had too much green tea this morning. Our first reader is going to be Ariana Raines, who really wants to go and be outside. Please welcome Ariana Raines. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Anselm. I'm so honored to be reading with these poets. Um, I admire these poets so very much, and I'm very grateful to get to read first today and to go outside with all of you and enjoy the reading outside. I'm only going to read two poems. Um, I don't like the poetry that I wrote over lockdown. I find it all very stilted. Um, but um, during, during the um, last year of the, um, the pandemic, I, I had like a exhausting love affair. That was sort of what I did with most of my energy. And um, I wrote kind of um, bad poetry. So I'm going to read two poems um, from that uh, sequence, and then I'm going to go outside with you. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me OK? Yeah, OK. It's really good to see your faces and some of your names whose faces I can't see. It's good to see your names. <clears throat> Poem I forgot I wrote. We were asked that week to celebrate the transplant of a pig's heart into the body of a man, 58, who was suffering from heart disease. Everyone had a cold or was dying. Only Pfizer was allowed to cure us. Public contagion had become a literal pneumonia, no longer only in my mind. My thoughts turned to gel. I could only write if I forgot what I thought. Everything I thought was taboo. So it's just as well I never wrote it. I couldn't write about my lover's mouth without thinking of a child. That was wrong. The pain of children, the way they cry. That kind of pain was what was between us. That kind of pain and its antidote. I loved him, Adonis, gored by a boar. Exactly the kind of person I have always fallen for. I have been using the despicable we I told my students not to use. It happened unconsciously. I became a lazy thinker during the period I was trying to train myself not to be such a vicious person, but all that time I was suffering from a form of dementia brought on by the Delta variant and a furious breed of erotic love, and what can I tell you, I got confused. And everything I wrote disgusted me, but admitting to such was like admitting your period changed your mood. Mein Herz schwimmt in blut. My heart was bathed in blood. I meditated, I suffered. In those days, you weren't really allowed to do much more than that anyway. I gave myself wholly to love. I closed the door in his face, sent him away, then went out to find him idling on the curb. Went up to him, screamed at him, and he screamed right back. Went back inside, shaking electric, texted that he should stay away from me using two separate messaging applications, doubled over upon myself and wept, yearned for his return. And he did come back, fucked my brains out exactly correctly the way 
way that I wanted. What else was there? I did never want to have any brains in moments like this. Human heart, human heart. I have always been open about this. The book that of stilted love poetry that this is from is called The Rose. And this is an excerpt from the title poem called The Rose. Yes, you can feel free to unmute and comment at any time. I heard myself in every cell the singer sang. The wind and the singer had to pass through her heart. When the queen ascended into view, I was with her, hiding in her darkness. When she fell from favor, I fell too. I governed myself with silence. I covered my wound in my own naked body. I said no protest words. When the stranger entered me, I'll forget his face, I told myself. I closed my eyes and I did not forget it. Though it was many a good thing in spite of this, I did manage to forget. Healing potions, songs, and secret sounds. The rose with its mouth like a child's asleep. Minaret, thorn, spire, steeple. Wishful flavor, exhausted people. Two cups of blood, one grain of sand. Receding flesh with your tooth in its hand. If I knew the words, I would bid the mother of us all be seated. As it is, I pull out a chair for my own mother to sit in. I offer her a cigarette. I light it for her in my mouth. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Ariana. Um, good luck with the sun today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe you can get the Jade of Feo the Rose uh, to be the cover image for the book. Our next reader is Timothy Liu. Timothy uh, is the author of 12 books of poems, most recently, Let It Ride, and he lives in Woodstock. Please welcome Timothy Liu. Hi, everyone. Thanks to Brooklyn Rail, Ariana for the stilted love lyrics. I mean, what better way to kick off the festivities? All right, so I'm gonna read all new poems. This is called Catch and Release. Tongue in cheek while they cornholed me. Copy that. Chalk it up to another botched rollout, another disingenuous act. Free and clear, with everyone biting, you can see right down to the bottom. Please tell me if I'm already dead. Fat chance. Sure look good in your daddy's waiters. Meet cute, might delete later. Copy that. It's my God-given right not to believe our shindig had become unmanageable. Copy that over and out. Feed a fever, starve a cold. Feed an Omicron, starve a Delta, swim the Hellespont, then drown in the Nile. Drink ayahuasca, vomit, bullet rye. Take what you like and leave the rest. Feed an addict, starve Purdue Pharma, open up a vein inside a Waterford jacuzzi. Freeze your ass off, watch my balls drop. Stock up on more KN 95s. Feed the Easter Bunny, starve Santa. That boarded up Cineplex looks good in candy apple red. Shop at Target, shop lift at Walmart, 
smash and grab those AK-47s. Occupy Wall Street, bomb Mariupol, fly Confederate flags over the Capitol steps, starve a wildfire, feed BLM, whoever thunk we'd have a 6-3 bench. Hail Brett Kavanaugh, farewell RBG, see you on the other side of explosive IUDs. Feed TikTok, starve MySpace, where mocktail nanobots have all gone viral. Feed a master, starve a slave, our man Biden fisting the orange dumpster, double jabbed or quadruple boosted, your Intel Core i7 is so last year. You know, I was walking over in Woodstock yesterday to get my second booster at CVS and a hornet uh, flew up out of the ground and stung me twice in the face. So I think I got three jabs yesterday. Uh, this is the fruit does not fall far from the tree. I thought so-and-so still loved me or wanted to have sex with me. Was it my husband? had been looking for anything mild to wild, had settled for, was actually quite vanilla when the clothes came off, when he got off, that is. Just wanted to get home to his wife and kiddos. Glad I was done with making babies. Been there, done that. Truth be told, I used to be careful, even selective. Some said finicky, others fickle of what I was willing to take into my body, whoever I'd let fuck me, and precisely which holes, what order. Now, every day, pretty much a slut best, a come hither what may, mask or no mask, vax or no vax. Even my mother has gotten in line the ghost of my mother, that is, before the metastatic cancer devoured the lining of her stomach, her uterus. Such appetite, we say. Each week, dad tells me what he's having for breakfast, right then and there, a fried egg, avocado on toast. Doesn't matter if it's 10 a.m. or 10 p.m always seem to end up in my father's head, his bed. The world imagined is the ultimate good. Unending pillow talk, things we've never spoken about. Morning wood, for example, his, mine, such appetite, so voracious and suddenly the grave cave now has us in its monstrous jaws. The fruit does not fall far from the tree, ready or not, ready to eat. Hunger. We eat lower on the food chain, shrimp, scallops, the future of this planet on our minds as we are that much in love, he loves his daughter, wants food left in the ocean long after we're gone. Everyone seems to be looking for an exit strategy. A poet once told me feeling a tiger sink its jaws into her throat was the way she wanted to go. A woman hooked up to a machine, the metastatic cancer twisting her spinal bones beyond recognition. Her secret lover too far away to shut her eyes when the last moments came, just as he had predicted. His wife having called her a five cent whore when answering machines instead of voicemails were de rigueur, as the French are fond of saying. 
her married lover called me six weeks later when news of her death had made the rounds. He who never got to see her stripped hospital bed. She was too weak for her last meal, died without leaving a notarized will. Intestate is what the probate lawyers said. Smell of blood in the air as everyone circled. Is it a crime to order a fillet of halibut or shark in times like these where the mythic imagination is to blame? We want our love modest, bite-sized, as little girls slurp down oysters at the roadside bar, unaware how their futures depend on ours. Self-portrait as strip mall masseuse. Open wide. I've been the sorry flavor of the month, the 15 minute backroom gangbang. I can say it sometimes hurt to be made to play the asshole in someone else's idea of a good time. Call me Jasmine, call me Pearl River coagulating in your throat. It took me forever to get here, decked out in my silk brocade. Won't you look at me now? Am I not the same woman traded in for the next model? Call me whore of the earth. I'm begging you to finger me one last time. Put a bullet in the back of my skull. I can take it. Hurry. There's a long line of wrapped men just outside the door, clamoring to cop a feel, all dying to get off. The war. At the base of the mountain where I live, when a man starts screaming, banging pots and pans, I climb up on the roof and wait for a bear to cross the road, sometimes a mother and her cubs. But this time, it's only geese leaving poop on my neighbor's lawn. Must be good for something, though what I couldn't say. What a reckless privilege can be on lands that were never ours to begin with. Speed limit signs blasted by a shotgun, leaving divots the size of golf balls where the paint had been. Dented metal underneath and a front to boredom. Hurry up and graduate. No need not to get out of town and leave the landscape to its lonesome. My neighbor's mailbox crowned with the silhouette of a moose was taken out by a snowplow, its door left hanging on a hinge. He must be popular by all the mail I see spilling out of it, weeds creeping up the rusted post. I suppose it's politically correct to mention how this land was unseated by the Lenape centuries ago. My ancestors squatting on another continent until the trains came through piled high with first growth wood and beaver pelts. A few forts remain on the pond with an island where a black man had been lynched. You can look it up on microfiche in our town hall, but no one does, trusting local rumors as we barbecue brown speckled trout the Catskills are famous for and you don't need a license to eat it. Ever grow tired of living? We've had it pretty good, proud to be stewards where taxes remain low, the pandemic notwithstanding. We can even speak a few words in a native tongue learned off the internet, sing some songs to bless the raptors who return each year 
even when a pet or two go missing. Sometimes birders can be seen climbing over barbed wire, their binoculars a dead giveaway. Don't believe everything you hear. Kids who scaled a cliff to reach an eagle's nest, they swore was glittering in the sun from miles off, its branches interwoven with collars, more dog and cat IDs than medals hung on a general. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timothy. And now I'll just note that um, if you haven't uh, come to any of these readings before, you should take a look at the chat because the chat will be filled with links to various books and works by all of our readers. Also, the, um, the reading will be archived and available to, to, to watch on the Rails events page and also on the Rails YouTube channel. So you can spread the word if you like. And now I'm going to introduce our curator, uh, Holly Liza Gafori. And thank you again, Holly, for uh, putting this together. Um, Holly is a translator, vocalist, poet, and educator. Her book, Gold, features transl her translations of poems by Rumi. And this book was just published a few months ago as part of the New York Review of Books uh, Classics series. And um, it's really great to have her here again. Please welcome Holly. Thank you, Anselm. Thanks, Ariana and Timothy and Fanny and Kaith for being here and reading today. Such a pleasure and to be with you all and to read among you. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna read some of the translations from Gold, um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a few of my own poems and uh, here's, here's the first one. War in her mouth, war in the living room every Friday, my mother painted it. Every Friday for a year, another piece of the looming billboard of her canvas became body, became fire, became gauzy nightgown of a barefoot girl, became brick and mud walls, arches, domes, bombed bridge, heavy sky, Middle East. How could she forget? Another hospital blown to rubble and a soldier points his gun at a girl on the front page of a newspaper. Her skin, our skin, our ancestors born in the mountains of Khorasan, Iran, studied in Aleppo, prayed in Mecca, walked the orchards of Baghdad, turned bushels of rose petals to rose water, said, the meadow is my prayer rug, trees, my minarets, the breeze swaying leaves, my call to prayer. My mother needed a model. The barefoot girl in gauzy nightgown was escaping in the foreground. She needed to study the protruding clavicle of a running girl. I froze for her mid-run. Friday after Friday, the girl took shape and the soldier, AK-47 in hand, chasing her or me, my clavicle, her clavicle, my flesh, her flesh. I guess I could just show the painting if uh, Eleanor's is here. Uh, that's that's the painting um, she made many years ago. Um, her name, by the way, is Marzi Nejad. Uh, okay, so I'll continue. We can move the paint, re restore the uh, the gallery of faces. Okay. Um, this is a, another Im image related to one, I'm working on a series of ekphrastic poems about her painting. So this is one other image, also very heavy um, in terms of the subject matter. On TV, desert flies clustered round a child's eye, animals at a watering hole, they sipped her tears, licked salt off her lashes. 
who had the energy to shoo the flies away, her arms, her mother's arms, bones, and the flies return anyway, iron filings sucked back into the magnets of her eyes. The glob of blue white paste on her lips, rice we dropped from airplanes, years after we dropped off guns again and again, rice we called charity. Mammals with no fur, we need so much to keep us warm. Socks, sweaters, four walls, a roof, an embrace, another embrace, another embrace. Vulnerable babe, tender one. There's an unending love, invisible and eager to wrap itself around you. Let it. Some words are like suitcases. So packed with meaning, they explode open as they cross the border from one language into another. Take fanna, for instance. A mass de hast gashte berto fanna nebeshte, roge fanna reside bahre safar berachsa. That's roomy. You who are drunk on self, union is your destiny, dissolution is your destiny. The map is in your hands. Taste the rapture now. Come and dance. Fana, Fana, the life giving death before death, the prison of self sheds like a bathrobe. You leap into a shoreless, you leap into love's shoreless sea. Fana, Fana, knots open in the mind, knots open in the shoulders, delusions of separation, lust for dominion combust. You slip through any opening, you rise like smoke. Fana. The only solvent for ego dissolution, compassion. Blood nourishes a baby in the womb. Blood thunders in a baby's ears. Reborn so many times, I know that music, he said. Come into my invisible dwelling, Rumi. See through my eyes. Love's wine flows here. Drink with no mind till you laugh with no mouth. Fana. Cho hastam nistam e john valichon nistam hastam. When I am, I am not, O oh soul. When I am not, I am. Fana. Transient excursion into the deepest calm. Now I find the lost paradise at the edge of a stream. Now I find the lost paradise on a crowded bus. Fana. Um, I was uh, in uh, Maine in 2016 and uh, was standing at the edge of a lake surrounded by pine trees. And there was all this stuff on the surface of the lake and I being very urban gal, you know, just reflexively thought it was some kind of pollution and thought actually it was like the dust from jackhammers, even though I was, that was just like the reflexive thought, even though I was, it made no sense to think that because I was in the middle of a pine forest. And then someone told me it's pine pollen. And I was so happy about that. Uh, and I learned a little bit about pine pollen and sort of wrote an ode to pine pollen. This is kind of an old poem, but I just feel like reading it because uh, this the season is end end of May, early June, where these this appears. Puffs of yellow dust erupt from the wind blown arms of pines, and those yellow grains let loose to the sky, sprinkling the wings of a dragonfly, are packed with blueprints for brand new beings. They are love letters to existence. Something inside the cells, inside the cones on every tree wants to keep this all rolling. Not just the pines, but also the bear rubbing his back against cracked and furrowed bark, the owl nesting in the hollow, squirrels scurrying down a limb, song rising in the grove. Something inside the cells, inside the cones of every tree commits 
to scattering the possibility of life all over this place. And what seems like excess peppers fo foliage dissolves on animal tongues, fires up the mating dance, urging and urging the procreant urge. And yes, it coats our windshields. Yes, it speckles my keyboard and makes you sniffle. But God, I love a good testament to love. I'm not sleeping tonight, why should I? The loons are singing across the lake, pollen still in my hair and on my skin and on the stars and the stars above just as abundant. I stumble in the darkness over grass, gravel and stone down to the water. I plunge into black ink and silver milk circled by pines. Constellations of pollen everywhere, swirling underwater, even here, swirling underwater, tapping my face as I swim out and wonder what pine-like giants are on the shores of the black sky overhead, shaking their manes and shedding stars. So now I'll read some translations. Um, Pambe vas vos bidun kun zegush to begushet ayad as gardun khurush. Take the cotton of the mind's incessant chatter, of the mind's, sorry, take the cotton of the mind's doom ridden chatter out of your ears, he said. He was often talking about our overthinking, tendencies to overthink. He says, take the cotton of the mind's doom ridden chatter out of your ears. We have one word in Persian, vas vas, for doom ridden chatter, the neurosis in the mind. Take the cotton of the mind's doom-ridden chatter out of your ears. Hear the booming voice of the heavens, the roar of fate, the ruckus the muse makes. There's a poem that's kind of a uh, conversation between soul and self. Since I mentioned soul and self in the Fanna poem, I'll read this. So um, on the page, the, the soul is talking on the left and the self is talking on the right. So I'll kind of try to indicate who's talking, although it may be obvious too. Okay, so the soul begins. Colorless, nameless, free. That's what I am. When will I see myself as I am? Put mystery in the middle. Where is the middle in the middle I am? And this silver tongue stream in me, when will it grow still enough to know the streaming stillness I am? The ocean I am drowned in the ocean I am, shoreless, boundless, wonderful. Don't look for me in this world or that world. Both worlds are lost in the world I am, a luminous void beyond profit and loss, wonder abound homes beyond fear of loss and lust for gain. My soul, you are my true eyes. What are eyes in the invisible visible I am? Then what do I call you? Silence, words can't name what I am. Then praise the wordless speaker I am. I race through emptiness footless like the moon. Praise the footless runner I am. Why are you running to reach me? Settle in the placeless place I am. Settle in the nowhere everywhere I am. The moment I saw Shams of Tadriz, I saw the supreme sea, treasure, and gold mine I am. I'll read this kind of odd one uh, that he wrote uh, uh, here. How could I have known this longing would drive me mad. Light a roaring hellfire in my heart, make a river gush from my eyes. How could I have known a flood would snatch me up and toss me like a ship in a sea of blood? How could I have known a monstrous wave would rise up, crack the hull, fling the planks in the air and drag me down to the ocean floor? How could I have known a whale would rear its head, gulp down the sea and leave a desert behind? How could I have known the desert's cracked seams would gape like a mouth sucking the whale down into bottomless depths? Turn after turn, now there's no trace of whale, desert, sea, me. How can I ask how? 
Every how drowned in an ocean of no hows. Every what and why dissolved like salt on my lost tongue. Like every creed and school of thought, I was awestruck, struck dumb by the ocean's opium, by the beloved flooding tangled groves of thought with light. What can I do but praise? Ocean of hidden pearls, black sea of stars, flowering fields of wide-eyed narcissus. I exhale, you expand. Shams comes from Tabriz with the key and the practice. Bitter turns sweet. We're so flushed with fire. We open like a rose. He says, let's love each other. Let's cherish each other, my friend, before we lose each other. You'll long for me when I'm gone. You'll make a truce with me. So why put me on trial while I'm alive? Why adore the dead, but battle the living? You'll kiss the headstone of my grave. Look, I'm lying here still as a corpse, dead as stone. Kiss my face instead. And I think I'll just end with this one. Um, and I'll, I'll sing a, a little bit of the Persian so you can hear it and then I'll recite the translation. Um, I'm trying to see if I could turn, okay. So here we go. He says, uh, and this is a, a poem that my father often recited when I was a child. Um, Yekhane porze maston, maston e nore sidan, divane gane bandi, zanjir ha daridan, jan haye jomle maston, del haye del parastan, noga khafas shekastan, chon mor bar paridan. Mastan sabush shekastan, bar khom ha nashastan. Ya rab che bad khordan, ya rab che mel che shidan. Ya rab che bad khordan, ya rab che mel che shidan. So he says, <laughs> one house, or the house, let's say, the house overflows with love drunk drunkards more come knocking crazed but still bound they tore off their chains you can't quiet this ruckus the heavens are beating their drum the heavens are beating drums in celebration ecstatic souls hearts that serve the heart broke free of their, from their prisons and launched like birds. They shattered the jugs. They don't need them. Their bodies are barrels. Their blood is wine. Oh God, what wine did they drink? Oh God, what love did they taste? I think I'll end there. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank you. Our next reader will be Kaith Heller, who's a poet, essayist, performer, filmmaker, and scholar. She's the author of a poetry collection, Firebird two chapbooks, critical studies on mysticism and poetics, and editor of a forthcoming anthology of international poetry translations, and is also the founder and creative director of the International Arts and Research Fellow uh, Collective called Vision Lab. Please welcome Kaith Heller. Thank you so much, Anselm, and everyone. 
Oh, I just <laughs> I love hearing this song. I wish we could all just sing instead of speak. That was really lovely. But thank you, um, Anselm and Nick and Halle and everyone at Brooklyn Rail. I will read from a book of poetry called Firebird. And at the end of it, there will be um, a brief video poem that I, that I created as well from the same book of poems. Part of what this collection Firebird invites is the sense that all our voices are needed at this point <laughs> to live and into an opening and away from complete insanity, especially now. It makes connections between the mythological phoenix and the sense of regenerative possibility it speaks of that begins with silence and a life that is on fire with our burning forests and the pandemic mourning and domestic violence, the destructive political cycles that we've been witnessing. And it suggests that trauma in the body is not the sole site of the real. There's a focus on unnameable love. And I was thinking about how our breath is a guest, <laughs> about how fire accepts everything it's given. And it's both for this reason, humble and insatiable about how it destroys us by turning everything it touches into light and heat. So I'll read a couple of um, different fragments from this long poem. The spirit neither sorts nor separates. We stroked the wounds, reached our fingers into these light shadows. Our fingers caressed the bones of all these broken strangers. Once I lay awake to watch my lover's face as he slept, his forehead, his cheek, his lips. Any situation can be an empty form, I continued. Like ours, you said, a secret conduit for the language of light. We brushed the bones from our shadows and left, then returned to them empty reading our x-rays like tarot. It hurts to remember you, your head bowing below your heart, your eyes like two cups full of blood. Earth has painted me white and adorned me with feathers, given me this mask of fire fashioned from the skin of my inner thighs. When I am laid on the altar and my life shatters, Earth says, the existence of the world depends on the heart's ascending flight. Something sobs in me all the time, all the time. When my lover touches me, what I feel in my body is like the awkward thrashing of a bird slipping out from two palms as the breath catches. Each moment, the limit of the flame to which it owes its flying. I do not know if it's called pleasure or pain, I feel him directly, as if what is silence speaks through us, as if we remember everything that has yet to happen and the awkwardness of the shroud arranging itself without the body, as if only being dead were fragile enough for what the earth has to say. Inside me, her eyes grow darker, blackened needles sewing a spectral garment she remembers and forgets. My body gets smoky, she says, gets holes in it. A country I can no longer tolerate, precarious as space and time, two forms of motion as a cross. The body is a metaphor, its desires, the mark a needle makes as it appears, disappears between the folds. Her body sutures the dark border between the roof and the moon. Things that enclose me and things I cannot touch, they are so near. Inside me, a girl was kneeling. She returned home after a long journey, but home was never there. Something sobbed in her all the time, all the time. The small flame in her shivered like an eye. Did she climb in, part her shattered chest and lick at the rose petals flowing over her bones? What did they have to do with her happiness or grief? 
She was that last unspeakable thing, the body like a field stripped to bare ground and then burnt. Only the spirit kept searching the ground. No one knows how to comfort it. It's like the moment a stranger, say, at dinner asks you, where's home? And do you hesitate? Then lie and tell him you live in Brooklyn. What you see in that moment is what the spirit sees. Why should I lie? Is my voice like the blackened earth, the voice of cinder? Who do you think you are, spirit, skipping from light world to light world, like a stone through its smeared reflections? A bird flew through my body. A messenger? Never knowing the difference between its own heart pumping 1,640 beats a minute and the heart of the world into which it flies. What trust? That must be why bird calls are beyond loneliness. So intimate and wild, they glide right into the depths of you and disappear there. So completely your own, you hardly know what is singing in you at all. And for the rest of the time, I'd like to play this short um, video poem. And the sound might be a little bit low, so if you can all um, kind of up the volume, you might be able to hear it a little bit better. Thank you. She could douse it with a gallon of lighter fluid, light the match. If she could watch like this always, always to watch, never to enter, never to feel the brightness catch and the fabric searing. Look how the mattress holds everything the body refuses to keep inside, leak, stain, spot, and mark. But nothing belongs to it. How will she hold herself if she cannot hold this? The exhausting wheel of wounding and healing burns. Look inside the mattress, the suffering burns. The desire to heal again through suffering burns. I don't want to feel, but how could I bear not feeling? She's been floating for years, hovering somewhere above her body, I said. Is this the bed she must enter? Is this where she was conceived in a bed of fire? Wings lifting up, mouth open, calling over the gauze of smoke, the dim orange hum coming and going over them. Did she know what knowing is? as the bed burned from the outside in, black flakes oranging at the edges, then breaking off in pieces to spark out on the sand. 
Which was the blaze that burned through the outer husk of her, which seared into the mattress, into every fiber of tissue and flesh, to burn away what she was, what she meant to become? There, where the wound is open, utterly still in its need, so completely still in hunger as the sway of yellows swell and fall over it, swell and fall. The skin of eyelids covering the whole of a body, eyelids all flickering, ready to exist along the whole horizon of its being, ready to exist, a unified weeping like the emergence of the soul, what do the dead want from us? What is the light of the inside? Light meeting light, like mirror meeting fire. The body of eyes everywhere, a joyful sobbing everywhere, a crackling wash of cries, where the glowing coals emerge, just at the center of the fluff of ash and blackened fabric. Last night, I felt the flames climb in at last to the inner core. They found the wire mesh of the mattress twisted in its skeleton of light, its body of glowing gold in the black. Joy or anguish to be born in fire in the elemental moment, to feel the flames coursing over my bones caressing every cell with light until at last the fire bent down low over the rib cage and reaching reached in my shattered chest was coiled like wire heart melted down to a single pore Then that heart melted into the form of liquid pearl, which wobbled, flowed over and rolled drop by drop to shatter into resplendences of grace, scattered as seeds of life and as light rays. Thank you kindly for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Kaith. Our final reader today is going to be Fanny Howe. Fanny Howe is the author of, I believe, over 30 books of poetry and prose, including uh, most recently, The Needle's Eye, Passing Through Youth, and Love and Die, uh, both published by Grey Wolf Books. I believe Fanny's coming to us from Ireland. Please welcome Fanny Howe. Hello? Hi. Hello? We can hear Hi. you. Can you hear me? Yeah, your camera is a little tilted, uh, so we can only see the top of your other. Oh, go. I see. I, I'm sorry. I got totally mixed up. I am indeed in Ireland now. In fact, I'm in a monastery where I have been coming for years. So I thought I would just be here in the poem too. And it's called The Monk 
and her seaside dreams. The monk is a single, and so am I. But which kind? All of them, from young to wild. And the boyish one, mine, cared for the weak until there was no one to care for him, besides an old woman who lived as a she. I became a penitent sequentially, first in sandals, then in boots, then with a hood and bare feet, now nightbound, now nude, then old. Another brother and I took a train with a view of mountains floating in water out of Limerick Junction to Houston Station, where Wittgenstein tried to discover emotion. He hit a horizon. Philosophy should only be written as poetry, he said. In a Sabbath atmosphere, you stand still and look backwards, for time has ceased its labors and no cattle tremble. You can contemplate the peripheries and for a flash, see the future as a field in a semicircle. Everything is even on the Sabbath. The died and the living, each person or place wants you as much as you want another. Towards a just and invisible image behind each word and its place in a sentence, we must have been sailing. Scarcely defended, best when lost from wanting perfect sense, but still recognizable. Be like grass, the phantom told us. Lie flat, spring up. Our veils were scrolls you couldn't walk into, but only mark the folds. I've lost my child on the bend where we parted. We will never come back to that time, hour. Let me write about the place again, the path so sandy and the tablecloth blowing in a wind from Newfoundland. It was here it began. She left her bouillabaisse untouched and headed out on the train. Sort of soft gold at sunset, turrets and sandals were hard to identify, so many copies. Let me concentrate on ancestral faces and I will recognize hers before my powers fail and our DNA has been smeared on cups and cigarettes, boxes and gloves, bowls and spoons, and replicated, sucked or kissed into the lips of strangers. I have to pass through the estuary to investigate the breakdown as a trail of nerve endings at the beginning of everything. Scrapes like threads seeking holes. It's a strange textile that serves as a roadmap. This one did, its blue led to the edge. Where could a fabric begin and end except as a running woman who sews and passes it along? So I ran with it in my hands, a kind of Eucharist, no break in its material from the first day on earth to the Sabbath where all are equal and the cows covered in sackcloth. Where has my mind gone? The bloody thieves are very quick. You may have noticed I'm naked and sliced by glass. Soon words will be disappeared and then the Celtic church and seven friends I will not name. One word that contains so many. Dearth, end, earth, ear, dirt, hen, red, dish. It and I must examine each part, then cut the ropes 
without a heart and set out. The slide downhill on my back to a ledge and the sea out there and a city to the left of the mud. The place they call an area preparing for an earthquake. Under shade and crowds of hungry old people lining for bread. One woman collapsed on her side and another helped her up. And I was let into the bunker by the best kind of communist. There was orange vomit on a large cape over a large woman. The hills, no bells. I went down for what reason? Not to enter a cell. Luckily, no one was white. We discovered we were in a loft space, space from the olden days that I indicated pleased me because I couldn't get my body out no matter what. I paused long enough to encounter a slender elder with the delicate posture of a Rastafarian. The people were indifferent as they are in whites, very polite. The lean man showed me the door in colorful clothing, but there was a huge blast from the building it, and we ran up rickety stairs to look at what was now a structure speared with broken glass and stone. A worker was already being transported on a stretcher. We looked around at the mess, then went inside to discuss our love of failures, every one of us. I hauled so many children after me with ropes and spears and nets like sea creatures that others would eat. Without them, I have no purpose. As in the gospel account, I believed in their belief. But now there would be what? For he, the little one, was kneeling and saying, you must run. The lover I still loved stayed near the door. So I raced off. You stood when the police came seeking coherence in everything. The total machine of retribution presses on regardless of a prayer or what a person did. This is incredible. We're breaking up. A trappist led me around as one of him to a ship heading for the country where they edit the best films there was a city on deck, residential, with pleasing evening trees, and then a downtown area until we couldn't tell the suns from the portholes on board. The ship would transport us to a staging dock in Iona. I would lose my baggage from the 20th century, though its particles and buckles were forged in eternity and make my private vows to the creator in every theater we entered. Together we traveled in a boat as it filled with night water from the bottom up. By night water, one means fear. So the refilling is adding a sting to the salt. Living naked still leaves you covered by a surface of wood, feathers, fur, or skin. Bear skin, blue skin, a muff of lamb skin over the ears where the thief can get in. It's lucky the mind freezes before the heart. Back there is the string of mountains your uncle painted and you lost. Out there is the clotted cream on a raspberry tart that he couldn't finish. There is the goose and the blackbird, the brindled donkey and the trap. They stand on the thin black thread of your lineage. Your scissors are split, your fiddle is cracked, its strings are thin and your mouth is dry, your clothes American. No more rush of notes as if a window is open inside. Only if you are insane or asleep and the gods and animals 
pound their way in on a divine night wind. Thank you. Back to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fanny. Okay. Great to hear you. Thank you. And uh, thanks to everybody for being here. And thank you, Holly, Kais, Timothy, Ariana, and Fanny. Um, next week, we're going to uh, have an event focused on a book, a new book by Barbara Henning called Fern, A Detroit Story, which is a sort of fictionalized uh, memoir written from her, her mother's point of view. And she'll be there to read from the book along with Peter Bush Yeager and Martine Bellin. So uh, join us next week if you can. And maybe we can unmute everybody now to uh, say hello and say goodbye at the same time as we seem to do every week. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hala. Thank you. 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 This was wonderful. Thank you, Aviana. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kaji. Thank you, Timothy. Everyone. Yes, Kaji. Thank you, Hala. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hi, Anselm. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. More singing, Holly. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Thank Who's you so that? much. Bob, I met your brother yesterday. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. That was fantastic. Oh, boy. Guys. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, Ariana, Thank you. can you hear anybody? Hey, Patrick. Hey, hey Anson. Good to see you, man. Yeah. Uh, there was a strong uh, component of Eros in many of these poems, which I, I really loved. Uh, Eros full. Him and Ariana, uh, but really it just sort of just ran through the whole reading, I think. Eros and spirituality. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. I agree. Go, Rumi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. Wonderful reading. Thank, Thank you all you. so much. Thanks, Anson. Thank, Thank you. Holly. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, poets, for saying yes. You were ex all extraordinary and mind blowing. And I just thank you. You was such a delight. I'm glad. Thank you so much. Take, Take care. care. Stay safe. Bye. Bye, everyone.